I was standing in my yard in 1957 when a faint point of light streaked across the sky. Sputnik was simultaneously thrilling and chilling. We finally had a presence in space, but the we wasn't the United States. I also remember when President Kennedy outlined our national to-do list. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. And when we crossed off the most challenging item. Armstrong is on the moon. Yeah, Neil Armstrong, 38-year-old American, standing on the surface of the moon on this July 20th, 1969. That's one small and of course, I remember when the last man to walk on the moon, Gene Cernan, complained to me that the U.S. had lost its space mojo. I sort of figured I'd be the last man on the moon in the 20th century, but here I am 43 years later, still the last man on the moon? Give me a break. He'd be happy to learn that eyes are once again on this piece of pockmarked real estate. Only the race to the moon 2.0 is not so much about who's planning to go, but who's not. Lunar traffic jam. I'm Seth Shostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. In Big Picture Science, we give you the wide-angle view on science and technology. The Lunar X Prize came and went without a winner, but the race to the moon is still on. Private companies are revving their rockets, even without cash incentive, and some new players in the game are warming up their launch pads. But can anyone's vision for the moon's future top that of a new science fiction novel? It's a standoff of imagination in this episode, High Moon. Well, Google's Lunar X Prize has ended, and we do not have a winner, folks. Private companies weren't able to arrange a moon launch by the March 2018 deadline. As you know, there is no such thing as a free launch, and this rocket contest was no exception. The company with a successful moonshot would have lined its pockets with 30 million buckaroonies. As it is, the money presumably continues to collect interest for Google. But our interest is looking up because the race to the moon is not over. Far from it. The number of companies and nations interested in orbiting its rugged landscape or landing on its dusty regolith is sheer lunacy. You'll find out who these competitors are and their motivation to commit to an Apollo redux. But first, we hope everybody has their seat restraints on because we have some news. One man, it seems, has beat them all. He's on the moon now. I'm Andy Weir, and I'm an author. We rely on science fiction to boldly take us to where engineers and financiers plan on going, once they've solved the technical and budgetary challenges of doing so, while companies and nations are reprising their last moonshots, going back to the drawing board, or sitting in planning meetings, science fiction writer Andy Weir not only has boots on the ground, but roots on the ground, a vibrant lunar colony described in his latest novel, Artemis. Andy Weir's first novel, The Martian, was an action adventure. An Apollo mission meets Robinson Crusoe as astronaut Mark Watney, accidentally abandoned on the red planet by his crew, grows potatoes and sciences the heck out of his predicament 34 million miles or so away from home. The scene for Andy Weir's latest space adventure, set only 240,000 miles from Earth, is a fully functional lunar base Artemis that is thriving thanks to economy based in industry and tourism. Visitors frequent lunar hotels and casinos, while Artemis city folk live in income-segregated housing. Some things do not change. The protagonist in Artemis, however, is a heroine this time, named Jazz Bashira. Science fiction has always led the way in shaping our future, and sometimes it actually gets it right. Uh, the movie Total Recall, for example, anticipated autonomous vehicles. So while we patiently wait for the next real moon adventure, we can use the fictional Artemis to imagine what a continuous human presence on our natural satellite might be like. Readers of The Martian know that its author was famously <laughs> finicky with facts, always trying to get the science right. A self-professed space nerd, Andy Weir also did his homework for Artemis, but still allowed himself to take imaginative leaps for humankind. 
Okay, I have to ask you, Andy. You know, historically, planetary exploration begins with the moon before attempting a mission to Mars. You did it the other way around. Any reason you chose the moon as number two? <laughs> well, um, The Martian was a story about, you know, space exploration, and I wanted Artemis to be about colonization. I started off with the concept of, I, I want a story about humanity's first city that's not on Earth. And so I speculated on where that might be. And to me, it's very clear that it'll be on the moon. Mars is really far away. The moon's much easier to colonize than Mars. And the moon has materials that you can make use of that are there, as opposed to, for instance, low Earth orbit. If you want to make a, a city in orbit, then you'd have to transport literally every gram of mass that the city is made of up to orbit. But on the moon, you have materials you can use. All right. You, you said right there that uh, the moon is, a, is an easier place to colonize than Mars. You know, that isn't so obvious to me. I mean, the moon is kind of short on things like, I don't know, air <laughs> and, and water and a lot of things. It's kind of a tough environment. But it's actually much more colonizable than you might suspect. First off, it's riddled with this mineral called anorthite, which is made of, among other things, aluminum and oxygen. So if you smelt that, you have metal to build your moon cities and air to fill it with. So it's true, the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, but it has a huge amount of oxygen. Okay, but you've, you've got to get it loose from the rock. Yeah, you you have to smelt it, and that takes an enormous amount of power. And Artemis is powered by nuclear power plants. Why why not just uh, endless <clears throat> fields of solar collectors? You would need literal almost endless fields of solar collectors. <laughs> like you would need so much mass in solar collectors to get the kind of energy necessary for aluminum smelting that it would be easier just to send the aluminum. <laughs> While the Martian was a man. Uh, Matt Damon, I believe his name was. Right? Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Your hero in Artemis is a young woman, Jazz. Was that a more difficult challenge for you in terms of character development? Yeah, it absolutely. Well, not character development, but just kind of outlook and attitude. Now, Jazz is sort of a tomboyish, and she grew up in a rough and tumble city. I mean, you know, it's a frontier town. It's not like a crime-riddled city, but it's still a frontier town. And so her culture and her belief systems and stuff are all from a culture that I made up. So by definition, I'm right on that. But still, no matter how equal we are intellectually, men and women see things a little differently. They approach problem solving a little differently. And I have no inherent knowledge of that. I've never been a woman. Um, and so I did the only thing I could do, which is subject matter expert. I gave the manuscript to every woman in my circle of trust, every woman who I could trust not to throw it up on the pirate bay or something like that, right? <laughs> and I got all their feedback and I made changes accordingly. She still comes off as kind of male, maybe because as a character, she is pretty immature for her age, but that was deliberate. <laughs> I see. Okay. So you did pass this by women. I was going to ask oh, you absolutely. that because, all right. And I made changes accordingly. Now, she doesn't have a professional <laughs> occupation. She isn't a brain surgeon on the moon or anything like that. But she is clearly bright. And I think that that's essential for you, Andy, because unlike in the movies where the heroes often win by physical force, uh, in your books, they think, or as the Martian said, I'm going to have to uh, science the something out of this. <laughs> and they like working puzzles. Uh, why do you choose to have heroes and heroines who think, not shoot their way out of a tough situation? Well, I think, especially in books, cleverness is much more fun to read than action. In an action movie, action's really awesome. But in a book, it doesn't come across as exciting. It's just being described to you, you know? Also, I mean, that's just kind of my mode. It's the kind of storytelling I like and the kind of storytelling I like to read. As a character, Jazz is literally a genius. She just is also extremely lazy and unmotivated, and so she doesn't really take <laughs> advantage of it which is why she's a delivery girl around town rather than, well, she could have been anything. <laughs> yeah, okay. But, you know, one thing that she faces all the time is the fact that you seem to be very inventive about putting your heroes in trouble. Yeah. You know, no, nothing seems to go right for more than a few pages, it seems. <laughs> and then, bam, there's a new problem that erupts. Yeah, and usually in her case, it's self-inflicted. Like, most of the problems she encounters during the book were because of decisions she makes either during the book or before the book began. And that's a real element I wanted to show because she's, although people don't believe this, she her personality is actually a lot based on me. <laughs> like ostensibly on paper, very intelligent, but still making really bad life decisions in her 20s. <laughs> well, obviously, it could have been too bad in the long term here. I, well, yeah. you know, I found success in my 40s. <laughs> the trip uh, here was not uh, yeah, yeah, that, smooth. That, that, that's better than most people do, <laughs> I suppose. All right. Now, you've constructed a very ingenious colony in your book. 
Uh, I, Thank you. I, you know, yeah, no, it, it really, I can imagine it, and you give enough detail that everybody can imagine it. Is that cut from whole cloth, Andy, or did you research actual proposals for lunar settlements? I guess what I'm asking is, is there some engineer somewhere here on Earth who will recognize your moon colony? Not directly, but of course, engineers all over the world will recognize elements of it. I mean, the idea of smelting aluminum that's sourced on the moon is not new. The idea of having a bunch of lunar regoliths serving as a shield to protect the colony, also not new. But I like to make things up, and so I specifically didn't go research things, because the fun part of me is doing the engineering designs. All right. No, but you did situate this colony near to the Apollo 11 landing site where, you right. know, there was a small step for a hominid. And uh, and it's a tourist attraction on the moon, although tourism, it's part of the economic sustenance for your colony, but it's, it's not the entire thing. Well, that ties in with the plot of the book, but we do find out that Artemis's main economics comes down to tourism because the price to low Earth orbit has been driven down far enough that middle class people can afford space tourism, although it's still very expensive. But then uh, later we find out that immigration turns out to be a pretty significant part of Artemis's income. In other words, expansion, like people moving there and bringing their life savings with them adds money to the system. And that's not very sustainable economically. So you have to do something. You have to produce something, not just... <clears throat> well, they produce tourism. I mean, that is a straight up income coming from the outside Right, but they don't make little models of a crater with a thermometer glued onto the side <laughs> to sell to the tourists. Right. Okay. Now, when we think about colonies on the moon or Mars, you know, I tend to think of those things that you see in artists' renditions, you know, sparkling habitats, <laughs> smiling, space-suited astronauts strolling across the landscape. We don't generally picture, you know, bars or mob activity or ghettos. Yet you've got them all in Artemis. Were you striving for realism here, or do you just have a dark side? Uh, I was striving for realism. I think that, you know, people are the same all over. And if you if you look at any city throughout any period of history in any culture, you'll find they have a lot of things in common. I modeled Artemis after Caribbean resort towns, because that's basically what it is. It's a resort town. And so you'll see that in Caribbean resort towns, where there's the glitzy tourist area and then the not-so-awesome areas where the residents live. And so it's the same thing. It's the same economic system. But there's something else that's intriguing about this place is that it's not an American project. It's not a European project. It's not Chinese. It's not Japanese. In fact, it's an effort coming from a rather unexpected quarter, namely Kenya. Um, although you make the point that maybe that's not so unusual, why is Kenya a natural place to locate a spaceport for launching people to and from the moon? Yeah, so I'm a big space dork, of course, and I've met with lots of uh, private and public space agency folks, and I've learned that pretty much all of them agree the main impediment to commercial space travel right now is no longer technology, it's policy. There's a group called Moon Express that wants to put a little probe on the moon, and they keep running into problems with all these like federal laws and stuff related to probes, and it's just a huge hindrance to them. And I thought a country could compete for commercial space travel by just having favorable laws. Like, hey, you know what? File a flight plan so we don't crash planes into it, and that's all you need to do. And so in my fictional world, Kenya does that. Also, Kenya's on the equator, which is an optimal place to launch from because you get the full benefit of Earth's rotation, which is about one sixteenth of the total velocity that you need to get into low Earth orbit. So it's a significant savings in fuel. But is it a significant savings compared to, I don't know, Cape Canaveral, which after all, it's pretty low latitude too. It's down there in Florida. Yeah. And that there's a reason we put it down there in Florida, because the closer you are to the equator, the more of Earth's tangential velocity you get on the launch. But, you know, Cape Canaveral is, I, I want to say it's at 20-something degrees latitude. Yeah. You know, Kenya's launch complex, the Kenya Space Corporation launch complex, which is fictional, it's in the book, is at zero. You don't shy away from including technical uh, information as well. There's a line that reads, I checked the core's index of refraction. It's uh, 1.458, a little higher than fiber optics usually are. Uh, you know, you, you have this kind of technical color in the, in the story. Sure. I always want everything to be as accurate to physics as possible. It's actually a really useful technique for the lazy writer because physics is very good at being internally consistent. You don't have to make up new stuff. You can just do some math to find out what happens. <laughs> <laughs> it, it writes itself. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, I'm not exactly sure what year the action is in your uh, lunar literary effort, but I would I would guess it's maybe on the order of 50 years from now, something like that. It's actually 2084 is when it takes place. And in this, I think it's similar to The Martian, which was also set in the relatively near future within this century when humanity is first trying to live on another world. Is there something about this time period that particularly interests you, or is it just easier to write without having to extrapolate too far? Well, of course I didn't want to extrapolate too far. Also, remember, this is supposed to be humanity's first city that's not on Earth. And so I tried to guess at when that would be. In the context of the story, Artemis has been around for about 20 years. So I had to say, when do we have enough technology to start building a city on the moon? And I picked 2064 as when that would happen. So that's about, you know, 40-some-odd years from now. So I kind of worked forward from there. Basically, the question is, how long will it take the commercial space industry to drive the price to low Earth orbit down far enough for middle-class people to afford it? Well, finally, you know, where next, Andy? I mean, you've, you've done Mars, you've done the moon, and after the Martian became a big hit, you said the, the real problem was the pressure to come up with another one. Yeah. You under that pressure now? Well, I think that, like, now that I've released Artemis, and, you know, people liked it. It wasn't The Martian. You know, it wasn't this huge, massive success like The Martian, but it was really unlikely that I was going to pull something like that off again. But it did sell well. People did like it. And even the people who didn't like it said that they really liked the setting, you know, the the city itself. And so what I'd like to do is write more books that take place there. I'd like it to be a series of books where I don't necessarily focus on the same characters every book. And I love that. Like Terry Pratchett's Discworld is a good example of that, where it's a shared setting, but lots of different things going on. And with each new book you read in Discworld, the the setting becomes more and more rich and vibrant and clear in your mind. Eventually, it requires zero suspension of disbelief to read a book that takes place there because it just seems as real to you as Chicago. Right. And so that's what I hope to do with Artemis. The Artemis Anthology. Something like that. Andy Weir, thanks so very much for talking with us today. Thanks for having me. Andy Weir is an author. His books include The Martian and, most recently, Artemis. Well, it sounds as though Andy Weir, at least, is going to stay on the moon for a while. Yeah. I guess we'll find out later if that uh, is mirrored in reality, whether a permanent presence is, uh, you know, planned and done. You know, in his novel, The Main Economy's Driving Moon Settlement, well, there's really one. It's tourism. Do you think that's likely? Well, I think that probably is likely, actually. I mean, people have done studies, sort of market studies, of, you know, uh, what people would go into orbit for, pay a lot of money to go into orbit for the weekend, and it's mostly tourism. They like the views. But that would be in orbit around the moon, not necessarily colonizing the moon. No, that's true. And that was actually in, in orbit around the Earth, too. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> but, yeah, colonizing the moon, that's indeed maybe not tourism, but the deal is that the tourists are in sort of an ongoing industry. It's like the city of San Francisco. They do real stuff there, but there are always these tourists coming through that add to the economy. The original moonshot had two players, the US and the Soviet Union. Thereafter, the space club grew but it still has a way to go. I saw a documentary about the moon and they talked about the different organizations on the moon. They talked about the American section. They talked about the Russian, Chinese, Brazilian, Indian, and they never mentioned Africa section. Why that documentary will need updating, the creation of an African space agency, and what science fiction got right about launching from Kenya. Next, it's High Moon on Big Picture Science. Can't wait for the next episode to drop? Well, be one of the first to listen to Big Picture Science a day early, only on Himalaya. Himalaya is a brand new podcast app where you can find every single podcast you love and some future faves. Whether you're a podcaster or a fan, Himalaya's got your back. Discover personally curated playlists and show your favorite podcasters some love with Himalaya's tip jar. It's free, it's the easiest to use, and we're adding cool new features every day. Go to your app store, download Himalaya, that's H-I-M-A-L-A-Y-A, and don't forget to follow Big Picture Science once you're there. (music) 
the space club was once pretty cramped with only two members, the United States and the Soviet Union. Yet these countries didn't have exclusive rights to lunar ambitions. At the height of the Cold War, a Zambian ex-school teacher named Edward Mukuka Nicoloso wanted to beat the Americans and Soviets in the space race. He created and became director of the Zambian Space Program. It trained astronauts on an abandoned farm. The Zambian space program didn't get off the ground, but it has been immortalized as more than folly. It was symbolic of national pride and technical ambition. And the name Afronaut, coined by Mr. Nick Lozo, recently inspired a short film. And now decreasing costs have caught up with the space ambitions of the African continent. My name is Alan Herbert. I'm vice president of business development and strategy for Nanorex, and I handle special projects in Africa and the Middle East. In his March 2018 article in Space Ref called Africa, the Black Panther will take us into outer space, Mr. Herbert references the technically advanced nation Wakanda in the science fiction film Black Panther to make the point that Africa's technological leadership is not all fiction. Incubation centers are popping up all over the continent, he said, with particular focus in space technology. African nations, like all nations, are finding ways to garner the benefits of space development. The Space Club is going to need a bigger clubhouse. Mr. Herbert's company, NanoRacks, develops products and services of commercial utility in space, such as a deployment system for small satellites known as CubeSats. Smaller, lighter, and cheaper are the characteristics of new space technologies, which allow emerging nations to play catch-up. But more than that, they are behind the formation of, or strengthening of, African space agencies in Algeria, Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa, Egypt, and Kenya. And a moonshot may very well be in their plans one day, if they don't skip it and go directly to Mars. Andy Weir's novel included a real-life technical advantage for his fictional lunar colonizers. They were launched from Earth from a location near the equator. But that idea, been there, done that, says Mr. Herbert. Alan, Andy Weir's science fiction book Artemis includes the fictional Kenya Space Corporation. But Kenya does have a space agency. Uh, At least it's in the process of creating one. As of Mm -hmm. 2017, the Kenya Space Agency is its name. Uh, What is the status of the space agency, and why was its creation a goal for the country? Well, the status right now, it's not there yet. They're hoping to have it this year because, you know, they just had an election, but they hope to have the Kenya Space Agency by June this year. Well, what does it take to create a space agency from scratch and why would a country want one? Well, let's look at Kenya, for instance. Um, They have been involved in space since the early 1960s. Many people don't know that Kenya has a equator launch facility that was built in 1964 by the Italians and NASA. And so they launched 27 rockets there into orbit. And because it's in the equator, a lot of countries want to launch in the equator because it saves on fuel, because you get an extra booth because of the turning of the Earth at the equator. So they save a lot of fuel being there. And so now Kenya's deciding they want to do things on their own, and they haven't launched anything there since 1977. But if you look at what's happening in space for emerging countries, and I don't call them developing because they're really advancing right now, space is very important for them because they have to buy all the data from somewhere else or get it from somebody else. So they want to have their own. And one thing that happens is when you look at small CubeSats or or satellites, it's great for Earth observation, for health monitoring, migration, weather monitoring, which is huge for agriculture, is good for national security. Many people don't know that a Nigerian satellite helped them find the girls that we're looking for with Boko Haram. So that was very important. And also it monitors climate change, So what I'm hearing is that space is the place to be if you're an emerging nation. Now, the space that you're defining is the space of low Earth orbit or geosynchronous orbit. We're not talking about the moon, although a lot of people are yet. (laughs) yet. Um, Now, coming back to Andy's book for just a moment, in his fictional book, Artemis, the moon is the goal for um, his fictional Kenya Space Corporation. Are there any African nations that have their sights on the moon? 
Well, I think they will participate. They're trying to go at steps. I think that the U.S. sometimes we go straight to the moon and then we don't go for 50 years. I think they really look at their step. They're looking at low Earth orbit and collaborating with everybody. But I think that a country such as Nigeria, South Africa, and even Kenya, Algeria, and Egypt, who have huge satellite programs and are looking to really work with other countries, I think you'll find that they will start participating in the moon programs of China, Russia, and the United States. And so it would become truly international because right now, Molly, I think to do any space, you have to work together. And that's what I like about space. It makes people come together in a sense. Well, you say it brings people together, but the Space Club has been an exclusive club for a long time, certainly from the beginning. And you've written about this and the obstacles that some countries have faced in not being included in space exploration from the beginning. So we're talking about the 50s and 60s. And, And what were those reasons? Well, I mean, it costs a lot of money to go into space, okay? I mean, we, the NASA budget is $19 billion, and that's not including the military. So a lot of these countries, hey, this wasn't the right time. But see, I used to live in South Africa, and I got my first cell phone in South Africa. And I always call it leapfrogging technologies. All of us we in our homes, we had phones, regular landline phones. But in Africa right now, they're leapfrogging technologies. And so any new type of thing, they're ready to grab a hold of to advance their countries. And so right now now, with the low cost of rockets going up, I mean, you've got SpaceX, you got Rocket Labs, you got ULA, you got the Chinese, you got the Japanese, you got all types of countries and companies launching things into space and it's getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Can we come back to the moon for a moment? Yes, we can. Okay. When we talk about setting your sights on the moon and dreaming about lunar launches, in 1964, the United States and the Soviet Union were not the only ones looking to our lovely satellite. Uh, The director of Zambia's National Space Program, a gentleman named Edward Mukuka Niklozo, founded the Zambia National Academy of Sciences, and he actually wanted to beat the U.S. and the Soviet Union in the space race, perhaps even to the moon. Uh, What did he have in mind, and was that a genuine attempt to try to go to the moon? Well, maybe for him it was a genuine attempt because he asked from UNESCO, he asked for $1 million, and he also asked for another organization, $1.9 billion, to do this. He was serious about this, and he did testing. He tried to train astronauts, and he called them Afronauts, basically. So that's a new uh, word. So he had an Afronaut training program. Yes, he did. He did. He called it Afronauts. And what did they do? he put things on their head and rolled them in barrels down the hill, all kinds of different things like that. But wait, wait that, that doesn't sound like a proper astronaut training program. I, well, or, or that's, that... what he, that's what he can do. And, you know, it's so funny. Recently, Kenneth Kaunda was asked about this in 2016, and he said it wasn't real, but he said it was a fun thing. And it was something very fun at that time. So if Mr. Nicolozo's aspirations to go to the moon were nothing more than a symbolic gesture. They were still that. And the idea was that the United States and the Soviet Union were not the only countries that wanted to leave Earth and go into space, but they were the only countries that could afford to do it and had the programs to do it at the time. Yeah, I mean, that for anybody, that's why the CubeSat revolution and even the opportunities to do research now. At one time, Molly, it was very expensive to do what they call microgravity research. But now, on the International Space Station, you can do microgravity research. Even the new emerging countries can start doing that. And even talking to some of the African countries and Middle Eastern countries, a lot of people don't know that it is very affordable to do that. And so there's a lot going on right now, which is really, this is a very exciting time. When I was, uh, I'm an aerospace engineer. When I was in school, we only had a couple of companies to work with or with NASA. People don't realize in Africa, there's going to be over 2 billion people there by 2050. And some people say, oh, what's, how are we going to do this? How are we going to feed? I mean, I see it as a place where a lot of creativity will come about. People re- don't realize, Molly, right now on the African continent, tech hubs are coming up all over the place from South Africa, from Kenya, Nigeria, Cameroon, Egypt. A whole lot of different tech hubs are popping up, hundreds of them. So I see a bright future there. Well, Alan, you grew up in... Berkeley, California, not far Berkeley, from California. where I'm sitting right now. Um, mm-hmm. When you were a young boy, did you dream of going into space yourself? Oh, of course. Since I was seven years old. <laughs> and at that time, I always tell this, this to my kids, too, that, you know, my STEM program, 
it was lost in space in Star Trek. <laughs> that that was about it because there was no really push, especially for minority kids. I grew up in a single parent family and there was no, for minorities at that time, there wasn't really a push like there is now. And so I dreamed I wanted to be an astronaut. That was my dream. I went to the University of Southern California and I wanted to be an astronaut. I didn't make it, but now I have the opportunity to help others to go into space and do the things that I dream of. Now, you write that the African Union is exploring the idea of creating an African space agency. Yeah. Now, there are a number of space agencies in Africa that are created by the nations themselves. What are the goals of an African space agency and how would they be different from those held by the individual nations? I think that's why you have the African Union which, when it was started. They know that working together, they can do more. And right now, in 2011, they did a, a study to start an African space agency. They've already set out certain centers for space research where they have South Africa as a center for CubeSat, Nigeria and some of the countries there for space research. They call it the Pan-African Space University, where it's all over the continent, and they're getting started and geared up to do this. I mean, it's something that you don't hear about a lot in the news, but they're meeting, they're talking about it, and I know that it's going to happen uh, sooner more than later. So one day we may have the ASA as well as the NASA. Uh-huh. And just like the European Space Agency, I really believe that by the year 2050 that there will be, way even before 2050, an African Space Agency where they're all collaborating together. I saw a documentary about the moon and they talked about the different organizations on the moon. They talked about the American section. They talked about the Russian, Chinese, Brazilian, Indian, and they never mentioned Africa section. And so I think that there will be an Africa section. And I think even with the African Space Agency, with them working together, they will be on the moon and they will leapfrog and go to Mars with everybody else. Well, finally, Alan, it may be too late for you to enter the astronaut program, although you sound <laughs> impossibly youthful and energetic. However, um, if in the next decade or two you have a chance to go into space, will you take it? Um, you know, I had the opportunity to go on the zero gravity plane. And that was where you have a couple of minutes, seconds of zero gravity. And that was great, too. And, you know, I probably would. It, I would have my wife would look at me crazy, <laughs> and, but um, it is something that I would like to do. But I really want to encourage young people who really haven't had that opportunity to say, hey, here's an opportunity to start a business, to start a space business, to go into space, to really be involved no matter where you come from, no matter what country you come from. It is open for everyone. And that's what my real goal is, to make space open for everyone and to make it a place where millions of people can work and live. And it's, it's for everybody. It's not just for a select few. Alan Herbert is Vice President of Business Development and Strategy for NanoRacks. He handles development in Africa and the Middle East, as well as special projects. Alan Herbert, it was a delight to talk to you. Thank you. Delight to talk to you, too, anytime. Alan Herbert is Vice President of Business Development and Strategy for NanoRacks. You can find links to his article about emerging space programs in Africa and to a new site for African space news on our website, bigpicturescience.org. Coming up, some people are getting positively giddy about a return to the moon. It's on everybody's crater craving list. I like to say the whole world is going back to the moon. This place is super interesting, always has been, and when we go back, we're going to be doing it together with other countries and other companies and with new technologies, and wow, it, it couldn't be more exciting. And that guy is from NASA, the agency that wrote the book on going to the moon. It's High Moon on Big Picture Science. Let's remember that the moon did just fine by itself for four and a half billion years. It had little to do with Earth except to cause some tides and see our blue planet in its skies. But that changed 59 years ago when suddenly the moon witnessed a couple of hunks of hardware coming its way. The activity hasn't stopped. And in case the moon thought at least it wouldn't see humans again, 
Surprise! I am incredibly excited about the idea of putting boots on the moon again. My name is Greg Schmidt, and I am the Deputy Director as well as the Director of International Partnerships for the uh, Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute, otherwise known as SURVEY at NASA Ames. Dr. Schmidt's institute used to be called the NASA Lunar Science Institute, otherwise known as LSI. Dr. Schmidt came to our studio to provide the rundown on the new moon players in town and the old, like the agency itself. NASA is still in the moon game. Its vision draws on emerging technologies to help humans live and work there. Imagine astronauts going to the moon and being able to look out and have augmented reality glasses that they're wearing telling them what kinds of rocks that they're seeing. Imagine sending machines out ahead and working autonomously to build via three-dimensional printing techniques that are maturing rapidly right now and using that lunar regolith to form structures. It sounds great. Perhaps the foundation for a lunar colony. The U.S. would also like to partner with commercial companies. But all these ideas are packed into a tentative 2019 budget waiting approval. So, meanwhile, let's check in with some of those commercial companies. We thought they were going to do what only governments had previously done, send a rocket moonward, land a rover, and transmit a short message back to Earth. That was the challenge for the Google Lunar X Prize. The carrot was $30 million. So why did the contest end with no winner? Dr. Schmidt has a guess. In my opinion, the issue is one of timing. The Google Lunar X Prize came out in 2008, and there was another event that happened in 2008 known as the uh, world's largest recession. And so there wasn't a lot of money that was available. And the Google Lunar X Prize purposely wasn't enough to do an entire mission. It's perhaps a third of the cost, something like that, depending on whose numbers you believe, of what it would take to do a mission like that. The idea is the X Prize wanted to incentivize corporations to actually set up business models that would be able to uh, do this regardless of a prize. And I think that that's happening. Okay, so even without the prize, the incentive is, in a way, still there. Do you have any idea which sorts of companies or even which companies uh, have lunar aspirations? And, And what exactly are those aspirations? How can you make money by going to the moon? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, that will be up to them. You know, that's a question that a lifetime NASA person such as me can't really answer. We have ideas You know, and so uh, uh, one of those ideas, for instance, is uh, resources. There are likely a lot of precious metals on the moon. There are uh, things that are perhaps even more valuable to a spacefaring nations, which is water. We didn't know about water, gosh, even 10 years ago. But it's in the permanently shadowed regions on the uh, lunar poles. Turns out that it's actually quite plentiful. And so if you can get companies that can harvest that and provide resources both for NASA and then for other um, voyagers that want to go to other places in the form of water for life support and water that you can split into hydrogen and oxygen and use that for uh, fuel for a rocket, that would be the start of an economic model. And there's probably a whole lot of other ideas out there as well. So both... China and India are planning to send hardware to the moon and are sending hardware to the moon. I believe that India's second lunar mission includes an orbiter, a lander, a rover. What is the status of these missions and what is their goal? Well, you know, I think that a big part of it is quite honestly similar to what our goal was back in the uh, 1960s, and that's national pride, showing that they can do it. India is the one that I'm more familiar with, quite frankly. They had the Chandrayaan-1 mission, which went up, gosh, about 10 years ago, roughly. And it was just fantastic. It unfortunately didn't last for um, its entire expected lifetime. But the data that came from that was just absolutely amazing. It was an international collaboration mission. There were um, instruments from the United Kingdom, from the United States, One of our survey PIs, Dr. Carly Peters at Brown University, had an instrument, the Moon Mineralogy Mapper was the name of that. And she was looking, as the name implies, for minerals on the moon. 
guess what she found instead? She found water. And so she was one of the first ones to see water in some very surprising places on the lunar surface. And right now, it just blows me away and blows the rest of the community away that we're talking about a water cycle on the moon. One of the plans of the Chinese seems to be to land something, people even, on the far side of the moon. Uh, and uh, nobody's ever done that. I mean, we've seen the far side of the moon thanks to orbiters, or our spacecraft for that matter, but nobody's actually landed uh, anybody back there. Is that harder? And for that matter, is it desirable? Is there something on the, the back side that you can't find on the near side? It's a vast unexplored territory, the far side of the moon. It's scientifically absolutely fascinating. Um, there's an area near the South Pole called the uh, South Pole Aiken Basin, which is uh, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, impact features. In other words, a feature that was formed by a giant asteroid hitting the moon, one of the biggest in the solar system. And so we have intense interest, and we have for many years, in going to this area and bringing back a sample. There's various craters, the Schrodinger Crater, other craters that are, that are intensely interesting back there. The far side of the moon actually looks different. It has a different character to it. There are various theories on that, but we really don't understand exactly why. And in terms of difficulty, on the near side, you're in communication with Earth all the time, direct communication. On the far side, you're never in direct communication. You need a comm satellite or more because you always will need to communicate with the Earth, with uh, ground control, Major Tom. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so that makes it inherently more difficult, too. So it's an ambitious plan. Did you ever want to go to the moon? Yes, yes. So did I. <laughs> Greg Schmidt, thanks so very much for speaking with us. My pleasure, Seth. It was an honor. Greg Schmidt is Deputy Director of the Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute at NASA Ames. But there's more news from NASA. Okay, I'm Jason Kruzan. I'm the NASA's Director for Advanced Exploration Systems for Human Spaceflight. The two words that every space nut wants to hear in the same sentence, human and spaceflight. NASA is working on an idea. Picture this and see if you can guess what it is, starting with the engine system. So it'll have large solar arrays and power propulsion module that looks kind of like a communication satellite. It'll have a place, like a habitat, the place where the crew will live, but also it'll be the first time we've had a human spacecraft like this that's in permanent orbit that also can move around. So it has engines that look like some of the science fiction engines that we've always seen in the movies. If you guessed an outpost orbiting the moon, you are right. NASA is working with the European Space Agency and other international space station partners in Russia, Japan, and Canada, and they've already contracted with industry partners to begin work. We spoke to Dr. Cruzan during a break from a planning meeting in Denver for this project. It's called the Lunar Orbital Platform Gateway. It is an orbiting platform and a series of kind of modules and capabilities that are in orbit around the moon. What we see is its future is doing the science activities, but also a staging point or a place where we can go to the surface of the moon or go out towards Mars. We want to build it over the next couple short years, so it's relatively small in size in comparison to the International Space Station. So it's not a station per se because it also has engines. Why put it around the moon? I mean, if we can put things in orbit around the Earth without too much trouble, it seems. I mean, what's the advantage of putting something in orbit around the moon unless you're you know, mostly interested in studying the moon? There's a couple of different reasons. One of them is, yeah, we do want to study the moon. The other challenge we have is gravity. So Earth's gravity well and the moon's gravity well. Putting things around the Earth, it takes quite a bit of resupply or propellant and such in order to keep it in orbit around uh, Earth. Around the moon, the gravity well is considerably weaker, and we can actually put this kind of infrastructure out there, and it doesn't take as much to keep it where it's at. And then while we're moving it around, just in our space area around the moon, we can also then take other things like going landers to the surface of the moon 
or the spaceships that we want to take outwards towards Mars with humans, we also need kind of a place to park those when they're coming back from those kind of missions or when we're building them up to send them out for another trip. So it's kind of that gateway, that staging point for opening up the rest of the solar system. It's sort of like a base camp for, I don't know, going up Mount Everest or something like that. Okay. That's a very good parallel. There's a lot of parallels in history to the same thing. <laughs> I guess that's true. So if I had a job aboard this gateway, you know, how long would I be on duty before I got rotated out and could go back to Earth and, and enjoy the amenities and pleasures of that planet? Yeah, so what, what we're envisioning at the beginning here is it's a crew-tended platform, meaning that people will come and go on a yearly basis, and what we'll do is we'll send folks up at least once a year for about 30 to 45 days, and they'll... They'll set up new science, they'll conduct research activities while they're there, and they'll also get it uh, ready to run science when the crew is not there. And it is an international effort, right? Correct. You said that uh, the scientists could go through an airlock and go down to the moon, presumably do some science there, maybe build a telescope on the far side of the moon. There are a lot of things you might want to do on the moon. But in the movies, you know, they have something that looks like, I don't know, a taxi, a space taxi that sails out of an airlock and takes them down to the moon and brings them back. How do these guys get down to the surface of the moon, whoever's on this gateway? One of the ideas in the long term is we would build lunar lander capabilities, Um, not quite like the Apollo landers, but something similar where you would be able to do a landing and then return from the surface of the moon back up to the gateway and stage out of that. That'll be kind of the next phase after we get the initial gateway going. Uh, In the near term, we'll do some robotic missions to the surface of the moon in order to understand more about the science, the potential resources that are on the moon and how those resources could be put to use both by NASA and by commercial industry. Jason, you mentioned that this could be a a jumping-off place, a base camp, as it were, for going to other places in the solar system, human exploration of, for example, Mars. People might wonder, well, what's the advantage of starting by the moon? That isn't very far in the direction of Mars, after all. Yeah, so there's a couple different ways on how you build missions to go to Mars. You could very much just launch everything into a kind of a low Earth orbit or close to Earth, build that up, and then launch a crew and send yourself out to Mars and back. The challenge with that, though, is at the end of the day, we'll want to go again. So one of the things that we're thinking about and why we have the gateway is we need a staging point where the spaceship that goes to and from Mars goes out, conducts a mission to Mars, comes back, it's parked at the gateway, we refuel it, and we turn around and we go fly it again. Now, what about the science that's going to be done on the gateway? I mean, uh, you know, what what science excites you? What science should excite me? It's interesting to listen in on all the different science uh, aspects here. We have scientists that study the sun. They study the the solar-wind interaction with Earth and our magnetic sphere that we have here on Earth. There's other folks that look at uh, origins of the universe and origins of the solar system, studying um, kind of the record that's on the surface of the moon to do that. Other folks that look at Earth science are just studying the Earth itself. Um, You can imagine telescopes on a gateway looking out and seeing the entirety of the Earth in the view of a single telescope and being able to study global weather patterns or interactions on a global scale all in one single view of a camera. Jason, Andy Weir's most recent book, his follow-up to The Martian, involves a colony on the moon, and it's not set so far into the future. Can you imagine this gateway as being, if you will, a gateway to colonizing the moon? Yes, I can. I mean, I I can absolutely see the ability first starting off in orbit and then being able to make landers that can land on the surface of the moon, make landers that can be be reused, really for self-sustaining activities like that, like colonizing and such. You need to create value in some way. Value can come in the form of science and and understanding and inspiration, but on a commercial sense, you got to find out what the commercial values are. The gateway is kind of a first step to opening up that other kind of utilization of the moon for many different purposes. Well, finally, Jason, uh, when will you know if the gateway is going to get the green light? The president has uh, made the request of the funding for the gateway. That will go in to Congress here, and they'll they'll either give us that funding or give us some slight modification to those plans. Um, But we're hopeful to be able to understand that here in the coming months because we'll get our appropriations for this year, and then we'll be then moving on to the money that we need to actually go build the gateway. Jason Cruzan, thanks so very much for speaking with us. No, thanks for having me today. Jason Cruzan is NASA Director of Advanced Exploration Systems for Human Spaceflight.
So what we're hearing is that while science fiction is already on the moon and has been for a while, actually, the real guys with rockets are getting back into it, and they're not restricted to players number one and two anymore. Right. It looks like it's become truly an international event to get off this planet and onto our natural satellite. Yep. There's plenty of science to be done of the moon and on the moon. And eventually, maybe even colonization is in the picture. Well, thanks to the team who are motivated to get involved with Big Picture Science without any X, Y, or Z prize, Senior Producer Gary Niederhoff and Operations Manager Barbara Vance. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to Big Picture Science High Moon. If you'd like to hear more Big Picture Science episodes, well, you'll find them in our archive at bigpicturescience.org. And you can also find links there to our guests. And if you're a podcast listener but prefer listening to over-the-air radio because radio waves reach the moon but podcasts don't, check out the listing on our website of the more than 140 radio stations that carry the program. And if your local radio station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like the show. And if you never want to miss an episode, subscribe to Bye Pie Sci. That's our nickname on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter. And to reach us directly with your comments, be sure to throw in some faint praise. Email it all to bigpicturescience at seti.org.